Hello, everybody. It's our Scientology Stories Peeling the Onion, and my name is Mark Fisher. We want to welcome you to this live broadcast. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce my co-host, Janice Gillum Grady. Hi, Janice. How are you doing today? Aloha, Mark. Aloha. <laughs> G'day, everybody. We are in for a great show today. Uh, there might be some things you might disagree with and some you really disagree with, but doesn't matter. We're in for a good show and everyone must behave. <laughs> exactly. Anyway, we put on a, a, a video uh, two days ago from our friend Robin Scott, who we've known for years. Uh, we knew him in the, in the Sea Organization and obviously in Scientology. And uh, we wanted to give him a chance to tell his story. And he put together that video. And we told him he could put it together however he wanted, and we would show it. And then we would follow it up with a question and answer uh, uh, show, which we're doing right now, where we can ask questions as well as the viewers. And so without further ado, I want to introduce our friend, Robin Scott. Hi, Robin. Hi, Robin. Hi, guys. Lovely to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, you're welcome. You're welcome. We're glad you're here. Uh, it was a fascinating story. It was surprising in, pa in parts. It was also controversial in parts based on the chat questions and things that people had to say, but also many, many positive questions as well. But we would like to, you know, discuss them with you if you don't mind. I'd... Uh... I'm very happy to discuss it and uh, uh, delighted to be given the opportunity to do so. Um, the one thing I'd like to say uh, before we get started, please, is I just want to thank all the people who liked the video on YouTube. And I particularly want to thank uh, the very kind people who made positive comments, of which there were several. Um, uh, I, I have to tell you, that each of those comments is like gold dust to me. It's really very valuable to get that form of validation and support. So just accept my warmest thanks. And um, I hope we can continue the conversation and that it will be equally rewarding for all of us. Great. That's Good. well said, uh, Robin. Uh, before we get started, I'm going to show this. This was a comment that we discussed beforehand. This is from Sea Org Tech Discussions. To all present and soon joining the discussion, please remain respectful, even if you have different opinions about what will be discussed. And that's our point of view on this channel as well. Uh, I personally don't agree with everything that Robin, agree, you know, his viewpoints, and I'm sure he wouldn't agree with everything that I have to say. But, you know, we live in a society, a free society, where we can share and discuss ideas and discuss uh, opinions. And we wanted to give him a platform. He's always been respectful to us. And, and we've always, you know, he hasn't done any harm to anyone. And so we wanted to be able to present those views. And we're not trying to, you know, upset anybody or that type of thing. But we just want to let you know that uh, uh, we're, we're an open forum here and people can discuss what they like to discuss. Right, Janice? Right, Mark. <laughs> yeah. And, and I'll tell you, there's one particular part of this, which is the heist of the knots materials. And that's what I'm excited about for people to hear that story, because that is pure bravery and guts and grande uh, kahunas. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Robin, uh, before we well, before we get started, particularly on that story, I, I just want to uh, let you know that watching your video, it reminded me of how I remembered you. I mean, I knew you, you know, because I'm old now, you know, I know, oh, yeah, Robin Scott, he was in the Sea Org and all that. But I, I didn't remember how I knew you. And it was great that mm -hmm. when you were in the video, you mentioned that when you were in the rehabilitation project force as the bosun in Clearwater, mm -hmm. I was the LRH communicator for a state's in Clearwater. And I used to deal with you and Mick Davies, who was the CO of States. You would come to see us about issues with the Rehabilitation Project Force. And that's how I remembered. Oh, yeah, that's right. I remember him from that. Go ahead, Robin. Uh, I remember that very well uh, as well, Mark. And uh, particularly whenever I think of, of you, I think of the, of the kitchens in the Fort Harrison, <laughs> right? Because I spent a lot of time in those kitchens. <laughs> Um, particularly while I was on the RPF. 
And I remember Mick Davis extremely well. He was a good bloke, nice guy. Yeah. And and I just have a picture of you over on one side of that room. And that's kind of how I remember you from those days. Exactly. And the only thing, I, the, the scary thing about those kitchens that I remember is the rats the size of cats. I, you know, at nighttime, you'd turn the lights on and there were these huge rats. And I'd never seen rats in my life. And it freaked me out. <laughs> I'd like to say those rats came with the purchase of the property. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Okay, great. Well, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, just to bring our viewers up to speed. Okay, one of the things that Robin is known for is the fact that he, along with some friends, they walked into the Scientology Advanced Organization in Copenhagen, Denmark in 1983 and uh, posed as Sea Org members uh, in uniform in order to obtain, illegally actually, but obtain the Ned for OT's uh, materials, the confidential materials, and walk out with them and take them away to, uh, I guess, the United Kingdom in order to deliver those materials in this group, okay? And uh, that's one of the things that he's known for. And he, he goes over that in his video, but we have, we have additional questions we'd like to ask for more details. So we're gonna start at that point. Is that okay with you, Robin? Great. Okay, great. All right, so my, I have my question. Okay, I know you. I know you. You went in to get the materials because you had started the Advanced Ability uh, Center in in was it Scotland, right? Is that where it was located? Yeah, yeah. And then you you said you got together with some friends and you guys decided, okay, well we're just going to go in and get them. And and it, it was a brilliant plan in terms of how to get them. But my question for you is, and I've always wondered this is, why did you think it was okay to go in and just take them? <laughs> Hmm. Um, well, I, I think the simple answer to that is because the Sea Org and the Church of Scientology had acted in an unethical way towards us. Um, and we can, you know, talk about that later in terms of the uh -huh. abuses that were occurring within the church. And so from our point of view, we were the good guys. We were the white hats in that situation. Um, salvaging what we believed at the time to be a valuable and important piece of technology that was going to help people get better. And, and our, uh, as Sea Org members, our commitment was to using that technology to improve conditions around the world. Um, and so we felt we had the moral high ground. And being good Sea Org members, we thought we were above the law and therefore, we felt entitled to go and pinch them with our cunning plan. <laughs> okay, now how long did it take? Uh, like when you got them, obviously, then you were able to use them. Uh, before that, were you using like David Mayo? Did he just write down what the instructions were? Or, or how, how, did, how did that go before you actually got the materials? Well, we, we, we weren't delivering, Mark. Um, before we had the materials. Uh, we, we, we took those materials in Copenhagen in December of 1983, but we didn't open our doors for paying clients until the beginning of January 84. So uh, it's an interesting fact that David Mayo, who had probably written the materials in the first place anyway, subsequently produced a new set of materials called the advanced ability levels, which were pretty much the same thing, but in his own language. Um, but, uh, but we didn't, we didn't need access to those because we would already got the the originals from from Copenhagen. Janice, um, can you explain to our viewers, like how did Hubbard usually like he came up with a rundown like uh, new aerodynamics for OTs? How would he put them together and put them out and write them? How, do, you, do you remember when you were a messenger, how, how that was done? Well, this one was actually done with LRH would write some stuff out, put it in an envelope, give it to the messenger who would take it down to Mayo, who was over at one of the other properties. Or he would discuss it with Melanie uh, Murray, who was the messenger responsible for tech. And Melanie might have done message runs to David or LRH would have discussed it directly with David as to how to do the different rundowns. 
And now I had always thought, yes, Robin. Just to interject there, Janice, uh, my understanding was that the knots materials were developed during a period of time where David Mayer was actually auditing LRH and a lot of the, the technology came out of those sessions. That's what I was just about to say, and that's what I thought as well. But a few years, a couple of years before David passed away, David came and stayed with me here in Vegas. And we mm -hmm. had a discussion about that. And David said to me that the, re the auditing that he did on LRH to get him recovered was mm. not the same. Ah, uh, okay. Mm. And he said he used totally different, and, and LRH was giving him different instructions than what David did in those sessions. And that was news to me. I didn't know that until just a few years ago. Sure. Or more and than David a few May years ago. And David Mayo, for our viewers, he was the senior case supervisor international. In other words, he was the highest trained at, uh, technical person in Scientology right below L. Ron Hubbard. I mean, there was L. Ron Hubbard who was founder and who developed and whatever. He wrote these materials. And David was the, the person responsible for it. So he was the person, you know, actually when L. Ron Hubbard died, I mean, if Hubbard, if uh, Mayo had still been there, he would have been the technical person left in charge. Mm -hmm. But uh, mm -hmm. so he was the highest trained person and he actually personally audited L. Ron Hubbard, as you mentioned. Right. Mm -hmm. But that explained, when David told me that, that explained to me why there were so many different message runs and back and forth on developing the Ned for OTs, the knots materials, because David had processed Hubbard on something different okay. or it morphed into something different. Okay, and Great. so I want to ask you, uh, Robin, just to go a little bit earlier, okay? Because obviously you left this, uh, the Sea Organization in 1981, as you mentioned, right? Um, yeah, yeah. And you left, be you left because of um, you could see the writing on the wall. C explain people a little bit as to why you left at that time in 1981. Yeah, I, I think I think there were th there were three reasons. Briefly, the first is that. Um, the, the, the organization became in increasingly authoritarian and, and abrupt, and people were just issuing orders, and it became a very unfriendly place. Um, like, like I, I think, in a sense, it was almost becoming a fascist organization would be the best way to describe it. I mean, after all, it was a paramilitary organization, as you know, because we were all in naval uniforms. Right. Um, so I think it was fast becoming with with David Miscavige's influence and uh, Hubbard increasingly ill at that time that 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 it was becoming a very authoritarian. And the other thing that we found was that it was becoming very money oriented. It was all about the money. It wasn't about helping people to get better. It was just out of getting money out of people. And that was not what my lovely ex-wife Adrienne and I had signed up for. But the other crucial factor was that Adrienne was pregnant with my son and we had, uh, I had two very small stepchildren from her previous marriage. So we were a family, we were about to become a family of five. And the living conditions and particularly the, the food arrangements were very poor. And we just got to the point where we didn't feel that we were making any progress in the Sea Org and we were living a rather unpleasant life as a result. And it just didn't add up anymore. So we 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 headed for the hills, Mark. <laughs> OK, and then it wasn't too long after that that you like you said, you decided that you wanted to set up this uh, facility that you that you purchased. Beautiful place. Uh, to, go ahead, Robert. Uh, yeah, it was it was um, almost exactly two years um, because we left early in 81 and we didn't get around to the events we've been talking about in Copenhagen and Scotland until the end of 83. So there was a, a good two and a half years where we just had a very nice life, uh, you know, as a young family. I was working full time living in Scotland. It was a very pleasant period for us. And then suddenly this crisis developed within the church. And my friend Neville Chamberlain alerted me to what was going on because he had his finger on the pulse. 
And as a result of that, uh, my wife and I decided that we were going to do something about it and that we were going to set up our own center where we would deliver the same therapy, but in a much more friendly and less expensive environment. Right, right. And that was going on like in Santa Barbara with David Mayo and other places as well, because that was when David Miscavige and uh, they basically went and they destroyed the mission network, the Scientology mission network. And they had the International Finance Police going around and basically stripping all the money, basically taking it from all the missions and Scientology organizations uh, into the Sea Org reserves at that time. And like you said, it was very authoritarian. I was sent to the RPF during that period, and uh, it was not a pleasant time to be around, for sure. Yeah. Uh, So let me ask you my next question for you, okay? Um, So you started, uh, you decided you wanted to start delivering these services and stuff. And at that time, you were still very much Scientologist, like, like we were when we first left, right? I mean, you had not lived outside of that Scientology world yet, did you? Well, I, I'd been outside the Scientology world for a couple of years, and I was no longer acting as a sealed member, but I still considered myself to be a committed Scientologist, and I still believed in the technology of Scientology that it helps people and improves conditions. Um, so when I realized that this crisis was occurring within the church, I, uh, my, my wife, Adrian, and I both felt that we wanted to do something about it because we believed very strongly, and as you know, I still do, that the the technology of Scientology has tremendous therapeutic potential. Okay. And uh, let me ask you this, okay. During that time period, obviously, 81, 82, you saw some of the authoritarianism coming down, and that's when you left, right? But you weren't around for, like, the abuses. That, like, are you familiar with the abuses that we're hearing about now, about elder Scientology, Sea Org members being abused, or children being abused, uh, that type of thing? Were you around for any of that, or did that all, that all occurred after you left? Is that right? I, I, I'm, I know that there was some abuses going on. I was... Uh, I have learned subsequently, certainly, that there was uh, there were some sexual abuses going on. And uh, I'm so I'm aware that not everything was rosy, but I think the extreme abuses that you're talking about, like locking people up and so on, um, were came later. And I, I think our intuition was good that we bailed out quite quickly, um, particularly because we had young children. And that was our our main motivation. We wanted to provide a good and healthy lifestyle for them, which we were able to do outside the Sea Org. And And then I'd been really out of things for two years until Neville got in touch with me and told me what was going on. And then we felt motivated to do something about it. So you were never around when David Miscavige was physically abusing people and beating them up or anything like that. You heard about that later, correct? Absolutely, my friend. Yeah. Okay. Now, I wanted to ask you, um, so you started delivering, obviously, the Scientology materials and everything at your Advanced Ability Center. And at some point, you decided, like I think you even said in your video, after reading the L. Ron Hubbard materials, the confidential materials, right, you decided... Mm -hmm this is science fiction and it's not workable. When did that happen? And, and, and give us your viewpoint on that. Sure. Sure. I'm happy to do that. Um, It really happened, Mark, around the end of 1984, when we'd had quite a good year of delivering and we had a lot of, you know, very happy clients who'd enjoyed their stay at our beautiful, you know, uh, castle in Scotland. Um, And we had some very good auditors working for us, so the results were always excellent and people were delighted. Um, But towards the end of that year, my own personal feelings about the OT levels changed uh, quite significantly. And I started to feel that this, uh, I don't know how much your viewers know about what the OT levels consist of, but One of the things about them that I found was that they're very introverting. They make you look within yourself for 
things that need to be handled, just to put it rather generally. I and think I they think know they, about they know about body thetans and, and clusters. Well, okay, so like you're that. looking yeah, yeah. for BTs and clusters. <laughs> and and to me that started to sound like gobbledygook. And the actual the actual supposedly historical event that had happened on this planet 75 million years ago started to me that started to be nonsensical because if that had happened there would be geological evidence of all those nuclear things you know so so that basically the whole ot story started to unravel for me mark and i suddenly thought i suddenly thought this is ron hubbard the science fiction writer not Ron Hubbard, the founder of Dianetics and Scientology. And he'd gone back to writing science fiction. He wrote Battlefield Earth as well later on, didn't he? Um, all of which I thought was really, to be honest, second-rate science fiction, as I said in my video. <laughs> and, and so at the beginning of 85, which was only 15 months after we'd taken those knots materials, I wrote an article saying that I thought they were rubbish. Right, right. You did. You did do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now can you tell people what you find positive about mm -hmm. the early Scientology uh, things, yeah. that type of thing? You find some of them positive for society, correct? Yeah, I, I, I found almost everything else in Scientology, apart from the OT levels, to be workable, authentic, genuine, and extremely helpful. I mean, if you think just about some of the most basic concepts like ARC and the tone scale and the dynamics and the, the training routines and the comm cycle and study tech, I could go on and on. There are so many bits of technology that he either stole from somebody else or put together himself. But the fact of the matter is that Dianetics and Scientology at that time, late 70s, was a very workable technology. And I also believe that the state of clear, which he outlines in Dianetics, the Modern Science of Mental Health, I have always found that a real and workable state. You know, I would point to Janice, for example, as a really good example of, 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 of a clear. And I think that's a I think that's a state that is well worth attaining when you are free from the effects of previous trauma. Um, and that's actually becoming quite a popular type of therapy these days, you know, PTSD and all of that. And I think to that extent, Hubbard was, was decades ahead of his time in developing a form of therapy that reduced people's previous trauma. And that's why Dianetics itself and coffee shop auditing was so incredibly successful in the 1950s, which is what made LRH um, famous, popular, and rich. Okay. Now, let me ask you this. There's one contradiction that I wanted to ask about. Scientology <laughs> is anti-drugs. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. You don't take drugs. Uh -huh. You don't, you know, no drugs uh -huh. and alcohol before your session and that type of thing. And then you get into actually becoming a cannabis farmer in the UK. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, two points. So, so one, my question is, how, is how do you justify that? <laughs> Sure, sure. Um, uh, one, cannabis is not a drug. It's a healing herb. It's not uh, 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 physically addictive. And it is probably the most benign medicine on the planet because it's incredibly therapeutic and has virtually zero side effects. And nobody ever in the history of time has died from taking cannabis, which is a remarkable fact in itself. Uh, secondly, uh, nothing in Scientology is true for you unless you have found it to be true yourself. And so I think Hubbard was misguided. He, he condoned cigarette smoking and alcohol use and was uh, extremely judgmental about, particularly about LSD um, and, and other substances. I should add that, that I've never taken what I would call hard drugs. I've never ever once touched cocaine or heroin or meth or any of those really ugly addictive opioids. I'm, I'm purely a psychedelics guy from the 60s. You know, mushrooms. Um, you took uh, LSD, right? 
LSD, uh, mescaline, those sort of things, and pot, um, are, are, are what I have found used judiciously and intelligently can be incredibly therapeutic. They're actually finding now, apparently, that um, magic mushrooms are incredibly good at uh, resolving PTSD. Okay. So that's right, my so defense. Let me, so let me ask you this then. <laughs> so you didn't yeah. believe, you know how Hubbard, we had keeping Scientology working, you know what I mean? Like, in other words, you don't yeah. question me. I'm the founder yeah. and the believer in yeah. this, you know, the uh, origination yeah. of all technology. So mm -hmm. you don't believe in that, right? In other words, you believe that obviously because you, you also believe in yoga too. I mean, you cover that in your video, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I, I don't take everything that, that Hubbard wrote as gospel. Um, you know, I think Hubbard and, and, and Donald Trump are very similar types of people. And I call them chronic bullshitters. And, <laughs> and that's, what Hubbard, that's what Hubbard was. He was a brilliant, brilliant man, very hardworking, very intelligent, uh, very uh, enterprising and good with people. He was a genius, actually. He was a, he was a screaming genius. But like many geniuses, he had uh, an ego and he had um, feet of clay, is the way I put it. He had faults, serious faults, that became worse as he became uh, richer and older. Um, so I'm, I'm not a blind follower. I'm not a true believer in any religion. Um, I, I exercise my own judgment. But nevertheless, there was a great deal in Dianetics and Scientology that I found incredibly helpful and which I still use to this day. But I reserve the right to my own opinion on subjects like, uh, well, particularly like drugs. Y yoga is, is, is a wonderful thing. I could talk all evening about the gains I've had from yoga. So I'm guilty of mixing practices. But I think Hubbard was wrong. But, but that was part of his his mania was that that it had to be he had to be the only one he had to be the only source he wasn't collaborative at all and that was his downfall really okay janice how about you what you you were around hubbard for a long time and you, we saw them we saw him deteriorate towards the end we weren't with him but uh he became more and more uh paranoid and uh that type of thing right janice uh yeah he did um and he didn't practice what he preached a lot, but, um, you know, uh, he did, was very, very against pot, it, you know, but you bring up the point of like alcohol in comparison, but people on the ship at parties, they drank that as long as they didn't drink within 24 hours of going in session. But we had, I know of two people actually offloaded from the Apollo for having pot. So, but I'm reading the comments. There's a lot of people who are very pro pot and, mm -hmm. and what it's done. Even my daughter put together that uh, CBD salve, which is getting rave results with people. Right, right. Okay. Now let me ask you the next question. Okay. So then you, you became a cannabis farmer. Were you just doing this like privately at your home and you got arrested? How did that all come about? Well, that's, that's a, that's a whole story in itself, and and if I can brief, I can, if I can briefly put a plug in, I've written a book about Scientology, and I've written a book about cannabis too. So the, the okay. full answer to all of these questions lies in my books. But to give you a brief answer, I mean, I I uh, smoked pot back in the sixties. I mentioned that in my in my video. I first smoked pot in Haight Ashbury in nineteen sixty seven at the age of eighteen. And that was a wonderful, wonderful experience. Um, interestingly enough, being in Scientology for 20 years or more, I didn't touch it at all during that period. And in a sense, funnily enough, I, I feel again that I owe LRH a, a debt of thanks because the 20 years that I spent in, in Scientology kept me off drugs and alcohol, allowed me to give up smoking cigarettes eventually and forced me to behave myself ethically um, uh, uh, as regards uh, the second dynamic. And I dread to think the trouble that I would have got into in those 20 years 
if I'd been out in the real world, I'd have certainly ended up as an alcoholic like the rest of my family. And God knows what I said. I'd have probably got addicted to cocaine like so many people did during that period. And I'd have probably been promiscuous sexually, um, which would have got me into a lot of deep water. So, so the, the 20 years that I spent in Scientology actually kept me out of a lot of trouble that I would have been in otherwise. Yes. So <laughs> well, I, I, I that first... to... Go ahead. No, no, I'm finished. No, I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say, for me personally, I've never used a drug in my life. I mean, I got in Scientology mm. when I was 13 years old. I was mm. in I was in athletics, and to me, drugs drugs were not the answer. And I got my drug mm. rundown when basically I didn't have any drugs except I mm. tasted beer or something. And my consideration on beer was I didn't like the taste. And then I did my drug rundown, and all of a sudden I liked the taste of beer. So they, they handled that, right? But um, I've always been able to, everybody's different. I've always been, I've always had a stop point. Like if I'm, if I'm going to have a drink socially, I drink to the point where I'm like, okay, I've had enough and I can stop. I have control of it. But there are people who don't have, I've, trust me, I've met a lot of them that don't have a stop button. And everybody's chemistry and everybody's re relationship with uh, alcohol and drugs is different. But I've never felt the need to use drugs. I always felt that um, I didn't want to have anything fogging my mind or, or, or that type of thing, which is, again, something that you learn in Scientology. And so I just have never, never had to experience it, you know. Go ahead, Robin. Um, you, you should read my book on cannabis, Mark. Um, <laughs> And I might persuade you to try pot instead of alcohol. But what, I, don't, I don't even um, drink. I don't drink even. I just, I oh, literally, really? I'll have a beer for dinner if somebody's having it, if I feel like it, but I don't drink even at all. Go ahead. Um, the, the thing that I found that I explained in my book about cannabis is that uh, for many years, for 50 years, uh, I, would, I, I, would, I would either have not enough or too much. Um, and, and the way I explain this is it took me 50 years to get my medication right. But finally, I got to a point in my mid-60s, about 10 years ago, when I found the, the right medicinal dosage for me that, that elevates my mood and acts as a very effective painkiller while, uh, while still being fully in control. And in fact, I'd go so far as to say that when I'm medicated, I'm better at almost every activity than when I'm straight sober, stone cold sober, because it enhances my mood in a very beneficial way. Uh, that's okay. Now, now, do you do you attribute that to the fact of your your body chemistry or that type of thing? Because you know, I mean, I for me, I always thought of it like you know, Hubbard always preached that you know, using drugs or alcohol to basically not confront, you know, like a lot of times people do those because they're, they're anxious or they have something they, they're not confronting, you know what I mean? So it basically became a crutch or a defense to get away from it. And so I've always looked upon it personally that way for myself. I don't know, for other people, like I said, I know some people have a different body chemistry. They react differently to these things. Is that, is that kind of what you're talking about or is it different? I, I think there are two aspects of it. Uh, when you use a psychedelic substance, what happens is that you go into an enhanced reality. Um, and in, in many cases, what that produces, Mark, is um, a, a euphoria and a, a, a peak experience where, where you have some kind of major breakthrough. And then for me, the trick has always been to try and replicate that without the without the psychedelic and i don't use other psychedelics anymore i merely use cannabis now on a daily medicinal basis and the reason i do that is because when you get to my age as you get older past 50 your body which has natural um uh, naturally produces cannabinoids for for your endocannabinoid system which is a very important part of your immune system your body, as you get older, stops producing those cannabinoids. And so it becomes highly beneficial to supplement your cannabinoids to keep your immune system in tip-top condition. Um, so I find that it's very good for me physically. 
I view it now as an essential uh, nutritional supplement for a healthy lifestyle. That's how I would describe my use of it now. Just okay. as I would take other various vitamins or minerals in order to enhance my health and enhance my performance, I find cannabis at the right dosage is very helpful to do exactly that. Okay. Now I have another point on this. Okay. We've had this discussion with apostate Alex who has a channel, right? And this is what he described auditing, right? Scientology processing. He described it yes. as it, it, it delivers a state of euphoria and it can become very addictive, just like drugs and alcohol. This, he just made this comment here in an audit. It can be addictive in a very similar way to drugs and alcohol. And I agree. Uh, we had, yeah. And we had that discussion with him and I wanted to get your viewpoint on it because I tried to describe to people, what's it like when you get auditing? And I said, when you're done, you're floating on clouds. If it's a good session, I, I, you know, you're, you're, you're feeling on top of the world. It's a, it's a, state of euphoria in some sense right and and yes. since i left scientology really i i i haven't really ever found anything uh that that produces that same feeling but that's just not a crutch do you know what i mean and so mm -hmm. I, i'm just wondering do you agree because you're you're still a scientologist or in your in mm -hmm. your opinion right um mm -hmm. Scient how do you how do you equate that um, scientology does deliver it can become addictive can it that's very interesting. You know, I was thinking just a couple of days ago, what, what a fantastic experience a good session was. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, like you say, Mark, you would come out of that um, uh, in, in a euphoric state um, of, of uh, excitement or bliss or happiness. Um, and I never found that addictive just as I don't find cannabis addictive. It's very important that everybody assumes that cannabis is addictive in the same way as alcohol and other drugs. It's not. And the important point is that cannabis is not physically addictive. Uh, you can get psychologically dependent on it. And certainly I've abused it in the past by using it too much. Mm -hmm. And other people abuse it particularly by mixing it with alcohol and other substances i like that comment everything in moderation that's a very smart very smart comment janice yeah i know that towards the end when i was starting to think of leaving the sea org i was getting auditing and i was going through a hard time because i did not like my senior who was mark inber at the time and i looked forward to those sessions so that i could bitch about him and or natter but <laughs> When I started think, you know, thinking of leaving, I what was like... What have you like, done to Mark Ingber? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. But I was kind of like, I found the auditing to become a crutch because I started wondering, how am I going to get through life without going in session every day and, you know, mm. getting things off or talking about it? And I was like hesitant. And I was like, well, I'm just going to have to, you know, pull up my pants and go on without it. And... But it had become a crutch for me to get through day-to-day -day life as an executive in the Sea Org. Hmm. Um, I, I loved auditing. I mean, I, receiving an auditing session, it, it, it was always one of the great pleasures in my life. Me and too. I'd, always get ex I, I'd always get excited. I think, I, I think the reason I loved auditing, I think, was because it was a moment of truth. And that's where I think the e-meter was a very valuable instrument. And people have tried to say, well, the e-meter is just a primitive lie detector. No, no, no. The e-meter was a thing of beauty when used correctly by somebody who knew how to use it because yep. it would pinpoint your right items. And that was the most important thing that I got out of a session. I, I once had 64 listing questions from Kerry Gleason. That was an experience. Mark. I was going to say two things for our viewers out there, okay? When we talk about auditing, it's not what you have heard about that most staff members have gotten in, you know, up in current times, which is called security checking yeah. or sec checking, oh, yeah. okay? Yeah. That's yeah. not auditing. That's not what yeah. we're talking about. Security checking yeah. is 
you've done something and we want to find out what it is you've done and you're being yeah. accused of something and they're looking for crimes. Okay. Yeah. That's what a lot of staff, including a lot of people who have channels, that's all the auditing they ever got. Or, well, they call it auditing because it's, it's done with a meter and all that, but that's all the Scientology most of them ever got. We're talking about the actual processes lower on the grade chart uh, in Scientology that help you with communications, problems, uh, having to be right all the time, you know, these type of things, dr the drug rundown, um, Dianetic auditing, uh, dealing with engrams and past bad experiencing experiences and erasing them and getting you so that you're a cause over them and in control. Am I right, Robin? Absolutely. And, and you know, I'll tell you a funny story. One of the reasons I got into Scientology uh, way back in, in 1971 was because the, because the incredible string band were um, Scientologists. You may remember that. Um, and I was a huge fan of the string band being, being a good hippie from the 60s. And Mike Herron, I think it was, um, was, was quoted to me as saying that Scientology auditing was better than ACID, um, which is LSD, right? He said it was better than LSD. And that immediately caught my attention because I was a big fan of LSD, of course. Um, and that was one of the things that really got me into Scientology. I thought, right, I have to try this. It's better than LSD. I have to give it a go. And, and, uh, and um, so, yes, auditing was, was almost one of the great pleasures in life. Um, and, and I, think, I think what happens if you're successful is you transcend the need for auditing to a considerable extent. You effectively become a, 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 a full-time solo auditor. You can look after yourself. You know how to get your own roots in and, and deal with your issues. Um, but I find, going back to cannabis, I find cannabis incredibly helpful. And I get very much the similar, similar sort of thought processes from taking cannabis as I do when I was in session. And that's one of the reasons why I find it so incredibly therapeutic. Okay. Now, as you mentioned the incredible string band, this is a question that I started earlier from Don Lambert. Question, did you know Leaky McKickney from the incredible string band? In 1982, she stole OT1 through 3 from AOLA, and me and my husband passed them off to all we knew. Did you know uh, that person? Uh I, 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 I didn't know Licky. I think she was called Licorice. Um, and she, she appeared with uh, the string band at Woodstock um, in a very famous appearance. Uh, I didn't know her personally. Uh, I've, I've, the only member of the string band I've met is Graham Forbes, who came to uh, Candy Craig for his OT levels back in, in 1984. But I haven't met any of the others. But I knew a lot of mutual friends, particularly of Mike Heron. So th that's a that's lovely to hear from Dawn. I really like that memory. Thank you. Yeah, I I knew Mike very well. He was on the ship as a public person to get auditing. And he, he was like one of my best friends, and he was there. And then later on, he and Susie Watson Taylor got married. Yes. And yes. after they divorced, Susie became one of my best friends. Is she still in? No, she passed away many years ago. Oh, no, really? How sad. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. She was a beautiful, beautiful girl. I love oh, Susie. Yeah. yeah, she, yeah, she, was. she was. Unbelievable. Wonderful. She tells a story, too. Person. She was friends with Robert Plant of Led Zeppelin, too. She used to tell us stories yes, yes. about that. Yeah. But Yep, but she had an affair with Robert. I know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, go ahead, Robin. <laughs> But that takes me to another point. You see, one of the reasons I'm so keen on Scientology is that it brought so many amazingly beautiful people together. And, and when I got to the flag band, land base at the end of 1975, I was blown away by the quality of the people that I was meeting there. And I'd, I'd moved in very high society before that, but I'd never been in such a glamorous situation as the flag land base in 1975. It blew me away. Fantastic experience. That's right. Okay, so now let me go on to the next question here, okay? At the end of your story in your video, you talk about how you still consider yourself a Scientologist. 
uh, but not for the OT levels. Yes. And then you also consider yourself still a C organization member. Uh, can you please explain that? And and that was one of the most surprising things that came out. I did not expect that when I watched your story. So please let our yeah. me and our viewers know what are you talking about there? Well, the the purpose of the Sea Org is to um, clear the planet, or in other words to put ethics in on this planet and the universe. Now, that is a, that is a star-high goal. That's an extraordinarily ambitious objective, not just to clear one whole planet, which in itself is proving well-nigh impossible, but to clear the whole universe. That's, that's an extraordinary concept. And most people would consider that a joke. They consider a billion-year contract to be just a piece of nonsense. Um, I don't consider it to be a piece of nonsense because if you really believe in reincarnation, if you really believe that you are an immortal spiritual being, and to give Ron Hubbard full credit, that was his basic message to all of us. You are an immortal spiritual being. Take everything else out of Scientology. That is the basic message of Dianetics and particularly Scientology. You will live forever. And when you take that on board, and particularly if you combine it with Buddhist and Hindu teachings, which say exactly the same thing, then you realize that when you sign a billion-year contract, you're doing it from the perspective of somebody who lives forever. You're doing it from the perspective of an immortal person. Because only an immortal person has a billion years to spare. The perspective that you sign that contract from is the perspective of an operating Phaeton, of an immortal spiritual being. And to me, that is the most fundamental truth in life. And I learned that from Scientology. And um, I think that the idea of trying to save this planet is a very honorable objective. And, and I totally subscribe to that. And I've given this a lot of thought over the years. After all, I've been out of the seal for 40 years now, but I've given it a lot of thought. And the conclusion that I've come to is there isn't another technology out there that has the potential to do that. And I defy anybody to point to any body of knowledge that's going to succeed in, in, in averting the catastrophe that we're currently heading towards, planet-wise. And so I remain committed to that objective because I don't see an alternative route to achieving that. So for me, I've become quite comfortable with the idea of coming back and starting all over again. After all, <laughs> if you join the Sea Org in your next lifetime, David Miscavige is not going to know where you came from. <laughs> he, he won't be there. He'll be in a, under a rock somewhere. <laughs> well, 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 whatever yeah. but well let, let me, I, let me, the point oh, go I'm ahead, making, Robin. Go ahead. Just one more point. If you look at traditional religions uh, like Christianity, Buddhism, Islam, etc., they all go through periods. You know, there's a good pope one year and a bad pope the next year. They've, they've got their act together or they're totally corrupt in the next century. Do you know what I mean? So as far as I'm concerned, the Sea Org is just going through um, a, a, a bad patch right now because it's fallen into the hands of people who aren't competent to run it. Um, although even David Miscavige has done a few good things and we can get to that later. The point I'm making is I still believe in the mission. And one of the sad things for me about people who've left the Sea Org or exited Scientology is that their, their belief in the mission has expired. They've lost that vision that they had, that they could do something effective about saving the world. Um, and that's why, I'm, why I still consider myself to be subject to that contract that I signed, and I intend to fulfill it. And I like that comment that came up just now about uh, uh, eternity. Because 
the life we are living is already an eternal life. We are already in eternal life. We are already immortal because the process that we're going through right now never ends. And that's the truth that I've become aware of quite recently, that we are already being immortal. We're living this life, but we're living it from the perspective that we're going to live the next and the next and the next, and that somehow, in a magical way that called infinity, it never stops. And I find okay, that so an exciting... Don't, Carry don't on. Go right ahead. Uh, just now, now to challenge on the other side, this is a comment that just came up from Med Marsha. It may be an admir admirable endeavor. However, it leaves the altruistic vulnerable to the Church of Scientology who is lying and exploiting. Uh, in other words, the abuses that uh, are going on in Scientology and that type of thing. How, how do you justify that or, or do you have any explanation for that? Well, uh, I certainly don't justify it. And if I may say so, I was one of the first people with the balls to stand up and say, this is not OK. Um, uh, yes, the current situation is a very bad one because because I still want to get people interested in in Scientology, but I've got nowhere to send them. Because there's virtually nowhere apart from the church, and I would never send anybody into the church at this point in time which is why I've written a book to explain what Scientology is myself so that people can read my book and without having to get involved with the church, they can start to learn a bit about Scientology. And, and that was my objective in writing my book, which is called The Significance of Scientology, because I still believe that Scientology is very significant. And I'm just sad that so many people have lost sight of that reality. Okay. And do you think it's because, do you think it's because it's been damaged so bad or you, like Miscavige who's in charge and basically running it into the ground? Is that, is that why you think that that's occurred? Like I, I, I just remember Hubbard used to say, you can use Scientology for good or you can use it for bad. And definitely I've seen it used for bad as well as good. How do you feel about that? Well, my feeling is that what a lot of people have done is they've thrown the baby out with the bathwater. Now, I was the first person to start saying that the, the, the organization was abusive. But when I exited the Sea Org, I exited with the intention to carry on uh, providing Scientology services, um, but without without the, the the negativity that you're talking about mark in a in a in a pleasant friendly and inexpensive environment um the the problem is i think i've noticed with people who worked for miscavige is that one of the results of working directly for miscavige with respect is that people seem to lose their faith in the technology they don't any longer believe that scientology works and that, to me, is one of the most damaging things that Miscavige has, has, has done. He's killed Scientology in people. So David Mayo and Captain Bill and I and the rest of the gang back in the 80s, we came out of the Sea Org saying, right, let's do this ourselves. And we tried. We failed. But at least we tried. But the problem with now is people are coming out and they're saying Scientology sucks. Right. So there is no message that the actual technology is of, a, of any value, which I think is a great pity. And I think that's a difference between people who came out in the 80s and people who've come out more recently having worked for Miscavige. And that's part of, of the devilment of the man, in my opinion. Well, and I don't take any offense because that last six years of my time in the C organization, I worked directly for him daily. And trust me, when I saw him take a turn, like a really bad turn, that was when I was like, I'm out of here. This is not Scientology. That's what I said to them. I said, this is not Scientology. I'm not, this is not what I signed up for. I'm leaving. And Janice, I'm sure you did the same thing, right? It wasn't what we, what we were there for, right? Right, Janice? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I'm just enjoying listening to you guys carry on. <laughs> okay, we got a good question here from a, we've got a good question here from Apostate Alex here. I'm going to put it up here. It's from yeah. Apostate Alex. He's from the UK and he has his own channel and he's a 
recent Scientologist. He's been out for a while. He's a, he's a young man. Question, uh, what are your thoughts on the totalitarian nature of Scientology beliefs? LRH Tech is the only way of helping people. No allowance for other ways. Isn't that harmful in and of itself? Uh, that's a very interesting question, and I, I like where apostate Alex is coming from. Um, uh, I certainly don't believe that, that LRH Tech is the only way of helping people, and I think I've demonstrated that in my own life. I'm using cannabis, cannabis. as a way of helping people. <laughs> Sorry? Cannabis. Um, and, 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 and I said in my video that I think that, um, that yoga is much better for you than the OT levels. I've had fantastic wins out of my yoga practice. So I, I don't accept the totalitarian nature of Scientology beliefs. Uh, and so I agree with Apostate Alex to that extent. But I would but I, I, I add this rejoinder, which is that there are certain things that Scientology does. And particularly, I would say, metered auditing, which we've all agreed on, was a very pleasant experience, right? And a very constructive experience. Metered auditing is, is the one thing that no other technology possesses. And for that reason, as well as others, but particularly uh, because I think that the way that the e-meter works, and Neville Chamberlain is, a, is probably a person who knows more about this than anybody else because he's done a lot of auditing. The way that the uh, uh, LRH uh, e-meter works is unique to Scientology and Dianetics. And I think that makes a fantastic difference um, compared with any other. And so I, I accept that we, I, I've... I've gained great benefit from combining Scientology with both yoga and cannabis. That's been a, a, a formula for me that's, that's kept me very happy in my old age. Um, but I, I still believe that, that, that Scientology is the only technology with the ability to produce the results that we need to save this world from mass extinction. And it's as simple as that. That is my core belief. I've never found anything else apart from Scientology that will do that. And, and my, my opinion on that is, is pretty firm and conclusive. Okay. And you're entitled to your opinion, just like everybody else is. Now, Thank that you. brings up the next subject that somebody's brought up here. L. Ron Hubbard is an OT, okay? And uh, what are your feelings about L. Ron Hubbard? I'm going to bring up this question here, okay? And uh, and so you could, we'll, I'll read it, and then I'd like to get your thoughts on it. This is from Michael Feldman. He's a member of our channel. Hi, Michael. Thank you so much. Question, how can you sincerely try to tell us that L. Rage had his ethics in? Look at his failed marriages and his relationships with his children. He was like the Wizard of Oz. He was not OT. What are your feelings towards L. Ron Hubbard? Because I agree his LRH was terrible in regards to relationships, his family, and his children. But that doesn't mean that he, he you know, I tell people it's the same thing. I mean, if somebody develops the uh, cure for cancer, just as a broad example, you're not going to care whether or not he was an adulterer or anything like that if it cures cancer or if it gives you benefit. Um, but anyway, Michael, what, what, or not Michael, uh, Robin, how do you respond to something like this? Well, I hesitate to talk about LRH because the person who knows LRH better than anybody else is Janice, and she's sitting right there. So, <laughs> but I'll give you, I'll give you my opinion, nevertheless. But with respect to to, to Janice's superior knowledge. Um, I'm not saying that LRH had his ethics in. I didn't say that. In fact, I right. said the exact opposite. I said his, his, his ethics were wildly out, and they got worse as he got older. Um, and I completely agree about the failed marriages. One of my most stinging condemnations of, of LRH is that he allowed his wife to go to prison for him. Yeah. I mean, you know, it doesn't get much lower than that, does it? He was you a know, coward. Let, uh, he was a coward. Right? Yeah. He yeah. was a he coward. He escaped. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. so I'm I'm not trying to tell you. In fact, the whole problem with where Scientology went wrong was that he didn't have his ethics in. Because if he had had his ethics in, we'd have we'd have succeeded. We'd have created the Sea Org that he had planned but which he himself betrayed by his own personal ad ethics. Not that the rest of us were, were a bunch of saints, let's be honest. 
Um, however, I do believe that he was an OT because you don't have to be perfect to be an OT. You can be an OT. Being OT means that you create you create effects in the physical universe. That's what it means to be OT. You're an operating Phaeton. You're a spiritual being operating in the physical universe through a material meat body. And that was and and if you look at what at the effects that he caused, the fact that we're still talking about the man so many years later, the organization that he built up, the technology that he produced, the wealth that he created. Um, I mean, Jesus, even if you thought the man was a pure con man, you'd have to admit that he was a genius level con man. I mean, the guy was unbelievable, the effects he created. I've, I, I, I cannot imagine being able to do that myself to get thousands of people all the way around the planet working for you on a common cause for nothing. That takes some doing. And that I consider to be OT. But he was an OT with his ethics out. That's how I would I would describe him. And he was a man. I mean let's let's be let's be face it. Yeah. We're all men. We're all we're all men and women who are imperfect. We are imperfect. All of us are. There's not a perfect person on this planet. And that's one yes. of the things I realized after I left Scientology, because I was dedicated thinking Scientology, the answer, we're the only way, we're the only road. And then I realized when I saw that Microsoft in the 1990s, I, you know, computers were taking off and 90 percent of the world was using Microsoft and a small percentage were using Apple. And, I, and it was spreading like wildfire. And I kept thinking, well, Scientology is so great. Well, why isn't it as big as Microsoft? Why isn't it taking off? And I mm -hmm. came to the realization that it didn't have all the answers. You know, it had answers, but it didn't have all the answers. And nothing yes. really has all the answers, if you think about yes. it, because yes. why are there so many religions? Why are there so many different philosophies and stuff? Because nobody has all the answers. And it's an imperfect world. And, th you know, there are bits of good in lots of all these religions and stuff. And you take the good and you try and make, make your life better from that. I mean, that's, that's been my, my viewpoint on it. Go ahead. Um, go ahead, Robert. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with that, Mark. I, I personally feel that you have to cut people some slack. And I think part of the problem is that we expect people to be perfect. Um, and that's an unrealistic expectation. And, so I tend to focus on, 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 on what I would say was the vast amount of good that Hubbard did while he was here. And I for, certainly personally feel that I've benefited from him enormously. Yes, he messed me around. He exploited me. Um, Janice, you'll be amused to know that I spent 11 days locked up as well. Um, and, I, you know, I was ripped off in, in every way. But I still feel that I got a fantastic amount of the out of the experience and I'm grateful to him for that and I can at least to some extent make allowances and forgive him for for where he went wrong because of the the fact that in my opinion he did a fantastic amount of good and I'm grateful to him okay and just so everybody knows we're in the question and answer period from from viewers i'm just popping them up here because we're having a good discussion mm -hmm. again apostate alex question if you don't believe ksw keeping scientology working <laughs> in that case only tech that works how do you decide which bits of text are good and workable and which bits are not well that's another very good question from apostate alex um i i i've come to the conclusion that it, it has to be an individual decision. And, and I, I quote the quote that I mentioned earlier, which is nothing in Scientology is true for you unless you've personally observed it to be true. Um, and so you take what works. For example, I love doing a contact assist, right? If I hurt myself, I find a contact assist is a very useful little life hack to, to deal with a, a, a piece of pain that you need to just dissipate but funnily enough I, I've never felt much about touch assist you see so for me I've taken the contact assist but I never use touch assist uh, so I've been quite selective in terms of what I use and I think that's the only way you can do it but I think also to some extent the basics of Scientology and particularly the data series if I may say so because that's one of my favorites teach you to think 
logically and analytically. That's the whole point, isn't it, of going clear, that you're analytical and not reactive. And so if you've gained that ability, you've also gained the ability to make your own decisions about which bits of the tech you, you use and which bits you don't, you know. Um, I don't think that we can say in an authoritarian way, this is what Scientology is and that's what you have to do. I think those days are over. Okay. Uh, just so you know, uh, uh, Robin, after you left, I became the David Mayo of the data series. I was the one who approved. Uh, Hubbard thought I was I knew the data series the best, and I was the one who trained all the evaluators on how to use it because it was, mm -hmm. it was very simple thinking for me. And uh, that was actually what I wanted to do when I continued, but I had to work from a scavenge, and I kept saying, I want to go back to, you know, applying the data series and stuff and but they would never let me do it and that's one of the downfalls of miscavige and one of the things he does is he takes people that are good at something and he makes them do something else you know what i mean mm -hmm. if you're good at a processor or an auditor oh he makes you in charge of the the camera in the movie production area and that's what he did with me go ahead you wanted to say something well i'm i'm just so interested to hear that you're a fan of the data series yeah because bearing in mind that i studied philosophy at Oxford, right, uh, including logic was one of the subjects that we studied, which never made any sense to me while I was at university at all. I thought they didn't have a grip on logic at all. Um, the data series in itself, in my opinion, is a quantum leap in the philosophy of logic. And if Hubbard had written nothing else, I think the data series deserves to be recorded in history as an important contribution to logic and philosophical thought. I use it all the time, Mark. Me too. In big and small, I find it incredibly helpful. It's basically how my brain now thinks. Well, it also explains to me how 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 humor works, how humor works, you know, things that are funny. I, I learned that from reading the data series. Hubbard says that... Uh, that a joke is basically a rejection. You laugh because you're rejecting the out point that you're seeing, yes. you know, and yes. if you look at a joke that's being told, it's saying something that's outrageous and you laugh because you're rejecting that out point. And I, I yes. spot that all the time. I can tell what's a good joke and what's not. Anyway, that's yes. just an aside. <laughs> Great. <laughs> all right. I'm going to go to some of these other questions here because we've got quite a few of them uh, and I'll just start down the list here. Uh, when you joined the Sea Org, how did oh, you yes. get around having taken LSD? They didn't, that wasn't a requirement at those in those days. It came later. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, it, it wasn't a requirement at that point in time. Um, but what happened uh, as uh, over the years was that you became more and more discriminated against if you were a LSD case. Yeah. Right. And I always felt that was really unenlightened of Hubbard and showed actually that he was scared of psychedelics. And that therefore... I always wondered, I always wondered if he took it. I mean, he was around in the 40s and 50s. You know what I mean? I always wondered, you know, when he was hanging out with Jack Parsons and all, did he try LSD, you know? Well, yeah, I don't think LSD was available until much later. It certainly didn't become popular okay. until the 60s. Um, I, I think Hubbard abused a number of drugs, uh, although I don't know exactly what he used. But I'm sure, particularly in his science fiction writing days, he was using speed and stuff like that, you know, to work all night. And, and, and so I think he was, pretty, yeah, exactly, exactly. I think he was pretty hyped up on all sorts of junk. Um, and, and he certainly didn't live a healthy lifestyle by my observation at all. So I didn't have to get around having taken LSD, but for example, um, it, it became a problem later, and I had to do the sweat program and the purification rundown, and I couldn't be posted in HCO and all sorts of other nonsense. Um, but to me, that was a sign of that Hubbard hadn't taken the leap in consciousness that we hippies had taken in the 60s. And <laughs> I, I always felt that that limited him to some extent 
in terms of his philosophical thinking. There you go. Okay. Thanks for the question, Natalie. Uh, Bert Pineapple, question. Do we know what happened to the staff of the Copenhagen uh, you know, advanced organization after they reported the loss of the OT documents, the confidential materials? Um, I, 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 I'm ashamed to admit that I don't know, but I think I can answer that with two words, heavy ethics. Yes, yes. <laughs> because I, I, rem I remember hearing about it. And um, from WDCC org, they, you know, because that's where you guys went was AOSH EU, the advanced organization. And um, yeah, there was a whole mission fired out there and investigation as to how these people could come in and just demand the stuff be turned over to them. And RTC was like all over it. Yes. yes. And actually, I think there's someone I know who I'm going to ask to come on an interview to tell us what were the results at the international management level. Okay. You know, and it, uh, it's funny because you then had uh, Jesse Prince and Kurt Weiland show up, right, from RTC, right, at, in, in England. Yes. Jesse lays out yes. his story in his book. Um, yes, uh, the ex expert <laughs> witness is that the name? Of, that's the name of his book. But yes. anyway, um, but yeah, no, I remember because I was in RTC at the time when when that all happened. When you did take the materials and stuff, and it was quite quite an explosion. Let's just put it that way when that occurred. Mm -hmm. um, but I, what's one of the things I wanted to ask you? So you had an agreement with Jesse and Kurt Weiland, which you you show yes. in your video. Mm -hmm. And then Miscavige yes. didn't, didn't didn't follow it. What were the, what was like the major points of it that that you guys agreed to and that uh, that he then violated? I'm I'm very happy you've asked me about that, Mark, because it's a very important point, I think, and I'd like to put my view on record. Um, basically, Jesse and I actually got on extremely well. Uh, we yeah. we were quite kindred spirits. He was a very charming guy, as I'm sure you know, and very hip and everything. So. We, we, we fell into a very pleasant conversation quite quickly. And we came up with a deal which, which we were both very happy with, which was that of, of the, the six defendants in Scotland and the four defendants in England who were being prosecuted by uh, the church for removing these, these documents, right, um, we, we offered to pay... Two thousand pounds each, right, as compensation for taking their materials, which would have given given them twenty thousand pounds, which is quite a lot of money in those days, a lot more than now. Um, at the same time, uh, we were going to uh, return all of the materials that we'd taken, and we were going to provide a written affidavit describing basically what we'd done with the materials. OK. And in exchange, they would withdraw all their litigation against us and that and, and we would we would all walk away from it. And both Jesse and I felt this was a good deal. We shook hands on it. We signed a document uh, summarizing it. And I provided an affidavit. Which, as you can clearly see, because it's in the video, was a proposed draft affidavit all right let me stress that proposed draft affidavit that i was willing to sign which was basically an admission of fault on our part saying yes we take the materials and this is what had happened to them and we accept that that's what we did and that would give the church some satisfaction that they'd had if you like a confession or a, an admission of fault would probably be the best way of describing it and what happened was that Jesse went back to RTC. No doubt he had to report to David Miscavige. And the deal was scuppered right there and then. But the thing that really pissed me off, excuse my language, was that they then presented that affidavit in a court of law in the US as if it had been signed by me, which it never was. And that is fraud. That's a, that, that is a, a, an abuse of the legal process.
that's misleading a court of law, which is a very serious right. offence. Very serious offence. Yes, Janice. Qu question for you. Was it after Jesse got with you and made that agreement that you ended up being invited to Sweden or somewhere and had to stop in Denmark and that's where they arrested you? Was it after no, that no. or before? Uh, Jesse, Jesse came came along nearly nearly a year after that event, which okay. happened, okay. which happened quite early in 1984, and Jesse didn't turn up until February of 85. Okay. And the the thing that's really upset me about that is that in his book, um, Expert Witness, he um, he says that I had provided him with what he came for, which was an admission of liability on our part. And he tries to suggest that providing him with that draft affidavit, which I never signed, was a betrayal of my friends and colleagues in the independent movement. And Jesse and I fell out big time over that allegation, because that is a slur on my character which I utterly refute, to suggest that I betrayed my friends in order to somehow save my own skin um, is, is a brutal, brutal lie and falsehood, uh, which I have always protested in the absolute strongest terms. And my opinion of Jesse as a result of that accusation is about as low as it is of David Miscavige, to be frank with you. Okay. Next question. Here we go. See our tech discussions. Question. Have you ever read the updated Knots version since 1991? The version you got from DK was much shorter than the one I've trained in 2000. Well, that's a very interesting question. And, and I'd be interested to know what it was like training in 2000. Um, no, I haven't ever read the updated Knots uh, version since 1991. Because as, as I've mentioned already, the whole knots OT3 scenario is, is dead in the water as far as I'm concerned. I have no further interest in it. It's gobbledygook and, 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 and really bad science fiction. Okay. Thank you for that question. Next question, hmm. Jane Post. Thank you for telling your story. Do you feel Scientology is a religion or more of an ideology of which uh, to live by? Mm -hmm. Another nice question. Thank you, Jane. Um, I tell you why I feel it's a religion, because a lot of people say that Scientology isn't a bona fide religion, don't they? They say it's not a religion. It doesn't deserve to have tax exempt status, for example. That's what's said very often. I tell you why I feel it's a religion. And I touched on this earlier. The reason why I feel it's a religion is because the basic message of Scientology is that you are an immortal spiritual being and you can strip everything else apart from that. But that is exactly what every great religion teaches. Every great religion teaches that there is a life hereafter, that this is not the only life, and that if you're shrewd and moral and prudent, you think more about the next life than you do about this one. Goethe said that this life is the kindergarten of our immortality, which I think is a wonderful quote. And so to the extent that Scientology uh, promotes the idea that you are immortal, I think it's a genuine religion and deserves to be considered as a religion. But it is also not just an ideology to live by, but a very practical philosophy. Hubbard called it an applied religious philosophy. And to me, that's exactly what it is. It's not just philosophy in an ivory tower, in a vacuum. It's incredibly practical. Hubbard had this amazing ability to get down to the nuts and bolts of absolutely any activity. I trained as a cook in the Sea Org. And, you know, there was a hat pack. There was everything down to the finest detail of what you need to do to be a good cook. And you had to train on it. You had to drill it. You had to be tested on it. You had to do practicals. And then you were you were fully hatted. And that attention to detail is encyclopedic. 
So it's not so much an ideology, it's a very practical methodology, is what I would call it, in terms of how to live your life. And I would say you, Mark, and, and Janice are a very good example of that, if I may say so. Okay. Thank you very much, Robin. Uh, we've got three questions from Vernon. I'm just going to ask them all at the same time. From Ver Vernon Salvatierra, question, Mark, did you meet Robin in the UK or the US in the United States? And the same question for you, Janice, he asked, did you meet Robin uh, in the UK or the US? Robin and I have never actually met personally, but <laughs> we, we kind of traveled in the same groups. Yes, Robin? <laughs> N nearly, but not quite, Janice. We, That's we, right. We, it's last year. <laughs> yes, we very, and you know what? Today is the 29th of September, which, if you remember, was the last day of your tour in Greece last year, wasn't it? Didn't you yes, fly home was. on the 29th? Yes. And, and Facebook keeps reminding me and showing the photographs of the great, great trip to Greece. Just so yeah, everyone yeah. understands what we're talking about. I did a trip with like those 16 of us to Greece last year. And Robin did an incredible job having been to Greece and been a tour guide there. He did an incredible job of putting the whole trip together for us. And that's where Robin and I really became good friends was working on that. Yes. Yes. I'm, I'm only sorry that I didn't come on that trip with you because I know we would have enjoyed it. But we'll get yes. together some other time, I'm sure. Yes. Yes, definitely. Okay, great. All right. Thanks for that. Here's the next question from Clearwater Cheryl. Question. Could you expand on what you said at the end of your video? The That learning about the chakras is the same as doing the OT levels. Thank you, Robin. Big hug. Well, thank you for the hug, Cheryl. I really appreciate that. Um yeah, wow. I could talk, I could really I could talk all day on this particular subject. I think the chakras is is, is very important. Um and, and let me just try and explain why I think that's the case. I don't know how much you know about the chakras, but if you study or practice yoga, you learn that there are seven centers of energy within your body, right? They they, they start they start at the base of your spine not to put too fine a point on it, they start with your asshole. They move up to your genitals and then to your solar plexus and then to your heart center and then to your throat, your speaking chakra, and then to your third eye, which is the sixth chakra, which is your intuition and psychic perception. And then the top chakra is called the crown chakra. And the idea is that that these, if you look at any diagram on chakras, there's lots of, if you Google chakras, you can see the diagrams. And I put one into my video. And the, uh, uh, the, these seven, they're basically energy centers. And they, they align pretty much with the spine, from the, the base of the spine to the top of the head. And the idea in yoga is that you get each of these energy centers, which can become blocked and inactive, you get them free flowing so that the energy flows up through your body. It's called Kundalini energy and it's most often experienced as sexual energy. So when you become sexually aroused, it means that you've got all of this energy flowing through your system and it's cycling up and down and up and down again. It's a fascinating phenomenon. I, really suggest that you study it as as much as you can and when you're actually doing physical yoga you start to experience it better and the idea is that you get all of these uh, energy centers in your body fully open your heart center fully open your mind fully open so that you can become enlightened in a nutshell and the the reason i think it's very important is that I think I've come to the conclusion that when we die, when we lose this physical body, the chakras are the energy center of what survives death. That has become my conclusion. If you do acupuncture, acupuncturists will talk about what they call the energy body. Because when they stick those pins in you, 
They're not sticking them in your physical body. They're sticking them into your electrical body. And that's why acupuncture works. It's a very interesting thing. So what I've decided is that the chakras are the spine of your uh, energy body, which is what survives death. And therefore, through the chakras, you can experience yourself as an immortal spiritual being. That's my that's become my belief after 35 years of studying yoga. And that's why I think that they are better than the OT levels because they work and the OT levels don't. <laughs> OK, well, that, that's we'll get into that, I guess, at another day, but also they can read uh, your books as well and, uh, and go into that more. <laughs> OK, great. Let Thank me go you. on to the next question here. Uh, uh, from Vernon, question, Robin, are you friends with John Atak, who is the author of A Piece of Blue Sky? Um, I, I, I know, John. Uh, we met a few times back in the 1980s when we were both very active in the, um, in the British independent Scientology movement. And John was a very important figure at that time. Um, I believe that he was on the OT committee, um, uh, the UK OT committee, which in 1982 declared David Miscavige as a suppressive person. Um, he also ran a newsletter called Reconnection, <clears throat> excuse me, which helped us keep in touch with each other and um, uh, helped us to I I expand uh, and export the message of independent Scientology. So John was a, a very key figure at that time. Also, his book, which came out, I think, in about 1990 or thereabouts, um, A Piece of Blue Sky, is um, one of the one of the the very best uh, books that's been written on Scientology. And what was I, I've always felt remarkable about John was that he he sussed LRH before the rest of us. He saw through to the dark side of LRH before the rest of us had managed to confront it. And his book was very prescient to that extent. And I have a very high opinion of John and the work that he did at that time. I'm not particularly friends with John. We've never been close, um, but I am an admirer of his work. He's a very clever, intelligent guy, and he played an absolutely crucial role in the in the development of the independent movement in the in the 1980s in the UK and abroad. I mean, he's a well-known figure uh, internationally. All credit, to Robin. Him. Robin, did you ever read Bareface Messiah by Robert Russell Miller? Uh, Yes, I've read pretty much all of those books at one time uh, or, or another. Um, uh, ben Corridan wrote a book, didn't he? Yeah, Madman and Messiah. Um, Madman or Messiah. Yes. Yeah. Or Messiah, yes. So I've read all of those. But John's uh, is, is, I would say the two best books that I've read on Scientology so far are John Atak's Peace of Blue Sky and Janice Gillum's Trilogy which she must complete. <laughs> this is book you one haven't, right you here. Have, it's not a, it's not a trilogy one? yet because I haven't put out book three. <laughs> I know. And you Janice must. with L. Ron Hubbard, and here's book two. You can order them on our site. Go down to the store. They're right down there. Just click on them. You can get an autographed copy of Janice's book. Thank you for that, uh, Robin. Uh, here's a question from Apostate Alex, okay. and everybody's commenting on it. Question, the one thing I think we're all really wanting to know, <laughs> are you still growing weed? And if so, how would one go about acquiring a sample? <laughs> Apostate Alex, I love your questions. I think you and I are going to be very good friends. <laughs> he's, um, in, he's in London. No, I, he's yeah, in London. he's outside Great. of London. We'll have, yeah, he's outside of London. We'll have to yeah. get together. Um, I, I, I retired as a marijuana farmer uh, uh, several years ago now, and I'm not any longer growing. Uh, uh, I don't like to call it weed. I call it uh, marijuana or, or grass. Um, and so I can't help you. Um, what, to be honest with you, what I do these days is I'm able in this country to acquire cannabis oil at quite a reasonable price. Um, and so what I do these days, if you read my book on cannabis, 
is I, I just put a, a, a few um, uh, grams of pure cannabis oil uh, into a brownie mix and, and take a small piece of brownie every morning and every evening. And I'm able to take a, a measured dose of approximately 35 milligrams, which is a very, very small amount of cannabis twice a day, 70 milligrams a day. Um, so uh, I would suggest you do the same. And if you get in touch with me, I'll, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll help you in your inquiries. <laughs> okay. Thank you for that question. Elsie has a question. Is dividing up families a good thing, which is something that Scientology does? Yes, yes. I'm I'm it's a good question. And and it's a tough one to answer. Um uh, re religions have been dividing up families since the dawn of time. I mean, look at the Taliban, for example. Look at the Spanish Inquisition of uh, the Catholic Church in the Middle Ages. Um, so there's nothing new about dividing up families. There are, there are uh, fundamentalist uh, uh, Christian sects like the Baptists and, and Anabaptists who, who go around shunning each other if they don't meet the, the, the required standards of the group. So the answer is no, dividing up families is is, is not a good thing, obviously. Um, and there's no doubt that Scientology, while we were in the Sea Org, I would accuse Scientology of deliberately undermining strong marriages. Um, I was very lucky with my lovely ex-wife, Adrienne. She's a tough cookie and nobody was going to drive us apart, but they certainly tried. They certainly tried. So I, I, I have to say that Scientology is guilty of dividing up families, and it is definitely not a good thing. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, okay, I agree. Next question, Danielle Chamberlain. That's Neville and Dan Danielle Chamberlain. Uh, question, did you have any in-depth questions, uh, sorry, in-depth questions in Scientology with my mother? Um, Danielle, lovely to be talking to you, my dear. Thanks for coming on board. Um, uh, hold on. This is the question here too. Did you did you have in depth philosophical discussions with my mother? Sorry. <laughs> I, I, I I could get quite emotional about this. Danielle's mother was a very special woman very special woman and funnily enough i listened to danielle's interview with you guys just a few weeks ago right yeah and the extraordinary thing about that is that i could i could hear her mother's voice in danielle's speaking it was quite spooky for me she talks just like her mother so i could hear her mother speaking through her jenny Jenny and I considered ourselves to be the intellectuals at St. Hill. So, yes, we did have in-depth philosophical discussions. And when I arrived at St. Hill, which is uh, September, well, funnily enough, that takes me on briefly to another point, which is that tomorrow, the 30th of September, is the exact 50th anniversary of my joining the Sea Org at St. Hill on the 30th of September, 1973. So the timing of this interview is really quite extraordinary, actually. But Jenny Brody, Danielle's mother, was a lovely woman, a really nice woman, and a very intelligent woman. She was a journalist from, uh, from I think, Rhodesia or South Africa originally. And she was, she had, she was the editor of The Auditor for, for I think, for several years. Um, and she, so she and I shared uh, a, 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 an intellectual connection and, and we had a lot in common. And when I first arrived, I think, I think Jenny had only arrived a, a month or two beforehand in 73 before I got there. So she was one of the very first people that I talked to when I was in the SEAL. We used to have a chat together uh, over mealtimes at Stonelands, funnily enough. We often used to sit at the same table. Bless you, darling. Thank you. Um, so, as you can tell, 
I was extremely fond of her, and she was a very, very nice woman. Okay. Thank you, Robin. Uh, we've got sure. another question for you here. Uh, Jobin Smith question. It was a great story, Robin, and you told it so well. She's talking about your video. Uh, you have such fine lineage. How did your family feel about you following Scientology? Did you have contact with your parents before they passed away? Yeah, that's a very good question, too. I could get quite emotional on that question, too. Um, my, my family were devastated by my going into Scientology. And then, of course, when I got into to growing cannabis, they were even more devastated, um, which is a great sadness because they were lovely people, lovely, lovely people. And I was very fortunate to be born into that family, um, many of whom have um, rejected me as a result of my lifestyle. When I, when I joined Scientology in 73, that was the end of my social credibility. That was, you know, I was a pariah after that. I was just a weirdo, um, which is sad, but it was well worth it as far as I was concerned. You have to bear in mind that that alcohol is the religion of my family. So uh, I was I was breaking away from from that tradition. Um, and yes, I, I did stay in contact with my parents, although our relationship was very very strained uh, the way my mother put it at the time was when i was in scientology we were speaking a different language which of course to a considerable extent is true given all the jargon in scientology um but i but we remained in contact and uh yes i i um i visited my mother on her deathbed okay Thank you for that uh, answer. And thank you for the question, Jobin. All right, we'll go on to the next one. Here is, where is it? Oh, here it is. Right oh, and my thanks to Jobin for a very nice compliment. Okay, great. Uh, the, I cannot pronounce that name. I, I, I'm so sorry. Uh, question, is it said that Captain Bill Robertson uh, developed de developed Excalibur level OT from the Knots pack? Does Robin, can he comment on that? Yes, and somebody, uh, I think it was somebody called uh, Lonesome Squirrel raised this question on the, on the YouTube video. Um, and I wanted to answer it because I think it's an important question. Uh, I believe that Captain Bill did have something to do with developing Excalibur, and it certainly seems to be promoted by what's called Ronzorg, which was the organization that he set up in Europe. Um, there is also another rundown that people do that I've heard of, you may come across, called Avatar. I don't know where that comes from or what its connection with Scientology is. Um, my view is <laughs> that I, I, I view Excalibur and any other similar uh, uh, process the same way I view the OT levels. I think they're irrelevant. Um, I have no interest in them. Um, and if I'm brutally frank, I would say that actually I consider that to be the definition of squirrel tech because that's, that's actually reinventing technology. So I, I, I have no time for that. And what about the, uh, I'm sorry, what yeah. about all the OT levels that supposedly we hear about these Captain Bill Robertson, you know, up OT 45. I think Janice, you told yeah. me stories, right? Yeah, when well, I, you, when I was in Russia. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, I, I've heard of all that stuff. Uh, Lonesome Squirrel uh, uh, asked me a very interesting question on the, on the YouTube comments, uh, saying, did, did I think that Captain Bill lost the plot towards the end? And I, I have to be honest and say, much as I admired Captain Bill and liked him very much, by the time he came to Canada Craig, um, he was already behaving in, in a somewhat eccentric manner, I would say. He was hardly sleeping at all. And um, uh, he was composing music that wasn't very good. And although he was very, very supportive of me, and I'm grateful to him for that. Uh, I, I, I think he faded away in, into some kind of madness eventually. 
unfortunately. And he died very young, tragically, which I would associate with the same thing. I think, I think sometimes people just lose the plot and then there's no coming back, sadly, because he was a wonderful character. Uh, uh, Janice, you must have known him very well, I'm sure. Yeah, I did. Well, not very well, but I worked with him a lot. You know, I mean, mm. there was a big age gaps, but yeah, I got mm. along great with him. Uh, we always, yeah. he was known, Hobbit used to consider Captain Bill someone he had to keep on a tight rein. He was very good at reaching out and getting things started, but he was terrible at maintaining. Mm. Mm. He was he was very successful as, as uh, COEU. And yes. and he was and 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 he, what I found, uh, when I go, for example, to Denmark or, or or similar places, that there's a lot of respect for Captain Bill, that they yes. look up to him, that he was he was considered to be a real super good guy, and certainly my dealings with him were were admirable. He couldn't have been more helpful. The fact that he turned up in Candy Craig was was absolutely astonishing. Talking about being the, you know the right place at the right time. I mean, that was uncanny that he, he focused. And he, when he gave me that sword that I talked about, that was an incredible gesture. I mean, what an unbelievable way of validating somebody for doing something right. So, you know, all power to him. But I think he faded away towards the end, sadly. Okay. Right. Thank you so much for that question. Uh, Betsy yeah. Sue, who's a member of our channel, <laughs> make sure you rock slam that like rock button, that everybody like that's button. watching. Hit that, hit that like that's, button. That's right. Janice rock says, slam rock the like slam button. It. Okay. And also, please subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. Uh, we, you know, we tell people's stories. We don't care what their beliefs are. We will, this is an open forum discussion. We are, we personally, I don't, you know, follow Scientology anymore, although I do believe in a lot of the, the stuff that I learned. But we're an open forum and we're here to discuss things. So please subscribe to our channel and hit rock slam that like button. And I want to go to the next question for Robin from Vernon. Question, Robin, after leaving Scientology, were you fair gamed by them? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, uh, well, I was I was driven to bankruptcy by them, apart from anything else. Yeah. And they did all sorts of nasty tricks. Um, the, the, the thing that I disliked perhaps the most, Mark, was that they sent plants to our center at Candy Craig. People pretending spies. to be friends. Spies. Yeah. Spies, exactly. Who were they did the same to us. us. They did the same to us. Yeah, I'm sure. And, and I found that very, very unpleasant. Um, but there you go. Uh, there's just one point I was going to make. I have a saying, you know, uh, once a Scientologist, always a Scientologist. And quite a lot of our friends, our ex-Scientology friends, make a point of telling me, oh, I'm not, I'm no longer a Scientologist. I don't, I'm not, I'm not a Scientologist anymore. And I think, oh yeah, so you mean you don't use TRs anymore? You don't use the tone scale anymore? You don't use <laughs> ARC anymore? You don't use a two-way comm cycle anymore. You don't use your stats anymore. The thing about Scientology is when you really take it on board, it hardwires itself into your um, intellectual infrastructure. And yeah. that is just the way you think from now on. The data series is the same, Mark. I'm sure you agree. You know, you're always thinking that's an out point. That's a plus point. What's the why here? Who's the who there? You know, and and so so I think... Well, I mean, but it's the same... Well, I think the reason we say that is because we don't agree. I don't agree just like you do about the OT levels. OK, I don't agree with Hubbard on everything that he's read as a rights. You know what I mean? So, I mean, yeah. I agree with you. There are basic concepts and stuff that are instilled in me as a person yeah. and they're not going to go away. Yeah. But the abuses yeah. that go on, uh, the families, the, the disconnection, um, the uh, elder abuse that we're finding out about. Yeah, I, I don't connect myself with that at all if that's Scientology now. And, you know, so it's kind of like that's that's what I'm talking about. Go ahead, Robin. I, 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 I think it's very important to distinguish between Scientology, the applied religious philosophy, and the Church of Scientology. Because there's a huge difference. The Church is controlled by Miscavige now. And is an absolutely abusive cult, unfortunately. 
Um, but the, the, but the, the technology, the basic technology, I still consider to be extremely valuable and extremely useful. And I would go one stage further and say it was because of Scientology that I was able to be successful with cannabis and successful with yoga because it gave me the intellectual tools to maximize the benefit that I could get out of those subjects. Right. And we can't, and I, we didn't even mention the axioms, which could be a whole discussion in itself about the axioms of Scientology. But anyway, um, I had another question here. Uh, where I just lost it. Oh yeah, here it can, is. Can I just, can I just say something? Yeah, go um, ahead. I, I, I'd like to thank the both of you for conducting this interview in such a pleasant manner. I've really enjoyed it. Um, I also want to thank your viewers for asking sympathetic and very interesting questions. And it's been absolutely, it's been, because I didn't know really what I was going to expect on here, especially after some <laughs> of the more negative comments. But it's been an absolute pleasure talking to people who take such an intelligent interest in what I have to say. There's one other thing I would add very quickly. Um, that uh, Janice's mother was a very important person in Scientology. Um, I only ever met her once when she came to talk to the RPF in 1977, it would have been. And the fact that she came to talk to us in the RPF, there were about 150 of us on the RPF at that time. Um, you see, the rules were that she wasn't allowed to come and talk to the RPF. The RPF were to be ignored completely by everybody who was in good standing. Right. But Yvonne <clears throat> came to talk, and I thought that was absolutely typical of her. And I have often said that if Yvonne's version of Scientology, which I refer to as the high ARC version of Scientology, if Yvonne's version of Scientology had prevailed, we'd all still be doing it to this day. And I believe that to be the truth. Well, we've discussed that too. And one thing, one concept, we don't have time to discuss it now, but I'd love to have you back on at some point, Robin, is the concept of love. Because I, I we talked with apostate Alex, love does not exist in the, in the world of Scientology in terms of its policy and the technology and compassion. Okay. They, they, it really doesn't exist. And it was the first thing that my father pointed out to me after I got out of Scientology, because he had been a Scientologist, left, got involved with another school, you know, another practice or whatever. He said, you know what was missing from Scientology was a concept of love. And I completely agree with that. And you probably have a viewpoint on that, but we don't have time to go into it right this minute. <laughs> Am I right? Yeah. Uh, the only thing I'd say is that Hubbard used to sign his letters love. And I know. he did that much earlier than other people did. And that was unusual at that time. But yes, I agree. Uh, uh, it, it wasn't a very loving environment, but it was no. a hell of a lot of fun. And it was very challenging, too. Absolutely. <laughs> Here's this uh, next question from Vernon. <clears throat> Sorry, uh, question, Janice. Does your daughter have a website for her cream? And I will put it up here right now. It's called <laughs> www.healedbyoracle.com. You can order her CBD. She's got a CBD uh, salve or whatever that you can put on sore areas and that type of thing and you can order it there you can get the information there and it's really wonderful stuff right janice oh yeah it's it's great you get pains or whatever anywhere on the body and just wipe a small bit on and that pain is gone yeah and that's that comes from cannabis right am, am i right robin cbd yes <laughs> yes it's it's what i call cannabis light um uh, we have a saying that there's no healing without THC. So I argue in my book that although CBD is proved to be helpful, the real thing is even more helpful. But that's just my personal opinion. Yeah, well, there's great. none of that in this product. It's just CBD. Right. Yeah, I understand that. Sure. 
Okay, well, we want to thank you, Robin. Uh, we want to, first, before we say our goodbyes, uh, please subscribe to our channel at Mark Fisher and Janice Gillum Grady. If you haven't already, please do so. We really appreciate uh, you watching our videos. And also hit that like button, rock sa slam that like button, whatever you want to do. Don't okay? just hit it, rock slam it. <laughs> if you want to be a member of our channel, click on the join button on our channel homepage. There's great perks. You can get an autographed copy of Janice's book. We do monthly one-on-ones with our peeling masters. It's really great. If you're interested, check out our membership and click on that. If you have any questions that we missed, ask in the comment section. I'm sure Robin will be reading them. I read them all the time and we answer them. So if you've got any questions that we didn't get to, please ask them in that comment section. And uh, Robin, we want to thank you for coming on here and also for uh, doing, you know, letting us put on your your life story uh, video that you did. And we'd love to have you on, right, Janice? We'd, we'd, we'd love to talk yeah, to you about more concepts because I, I believe in philosophical discussions about these things. Don't you, Janice? I do. I mean, I just sat there enjoying listening to you guys go back and forth. You know, it was fun. And like Robin, I'd like to say, you are definitely a fascinating and you are an interesting individual and is somebody that we're glad that we know. And uh, you may have opinions that other people don't agree with, but that's OK. I have opinions with people that I don't agree with, both politically and philosophically. But that doesn't take that's away it. the likingness uh, of, of people, you know. Right. Exactly, Mark. And that's what's so great about this. We can all be civil about it, all not agree but agree. Well, thank you both. It's been an absolute pleasure. I've really enjoyed our conversation. Great. Uh, Robin, anything else you'd like to say before we end off? Namaste, my friends. <laughs> <laughs> Namaste. Okay. So hold on. Uh, hold on, Robin. Don't hang up because I'm going to play our exit video and uh, we'll be talking to you just in a minute. Okay. Thanks everybody thank for so watching much. and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you.